Okay, so hello everybody in the third panel of the today's seminar. Um, and um, so far, much has been said about the inclusion and excellence already. So in this session, we will try to look at the inclusion and excellence through the lenses of the collaborative partnerships. Um, here on site with me, um, it's uh, Deirdre Lennon and uh, Lloyd Hudson. Um, so Deirdre is the head of sector for human and social development policy priorities of the Directorate General for International Partnerships at the European Commission. And Deidre also has a lot of experiences in international cooperation in higher education related in Eastern Europe, uh, Balkans, Russia Federation. And in the last years, she's very much involved in the cooperation with um, Africa in her capacity as the head of the sector. Uh, Lloyd um, is a CSER senior advisor for learning and teaching. He participated in a range of education and internationalization topics for Erasmus Student Network and has also been previously working at the Higher Education and International Cooperation Units of the European Commission's Director General for Education, Youth, Sports and Culture. And in virtual settings, we have with us um, Matthijs Landsmeer and Hilde Harant Kramer. I hope I manage the pronunciation properly. Um, so Hilde is the head of the Department um, for Global Cooperation and Capacity Building at the Norwegian Directorate for Higher Education and Skills. And Hilde has been acting as the Educational Attaché at the Royal Norwegian Consulate General in New York previously, and was also Administrative Head of the Center for Care Research at Western Norway University of Applied Science. And Matthijs, um, is a regional manager for MENA region of NUFIX EU-funded programs in Jordan and Lebanon, focusing on providing educational projects for Syrian refugees um, and vulnerable youth in these countries. And he is also responsible for the NUFIX Orange Knowledge Program in Bangladesh, Myanmar and Colombia, where Dutch and local knowledge institutes work together on strengthening the educational sector and enhancing labor market access. So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us in the panel. Um, and would, I would like to go, uh, Deidre, to you first uh, with a question. Um, could you share with us how, um, what are the approaches that your DG um, is taking in collaboration with the Africa and ACP? And which aspects would you consider inclusive and which ones are based on the excellence? And what do you think that, I mean, are the potentials that they could be even further explored? Thank you. Thank you, Elenka. Um, I think I've got a presentation. Um, just, yeah. Um, if you allow me, I'm going to just step back, zoom outwards a little bit, because I'm going to... Um, talk about the Global Gateway and try and uh, look at where higher education can contribute to that. And then we're going to look a little bit on you know, what, what would be addressing this from the excellence point of view and then from the inclusiveness point of view. Um, the Global Gateway is um, Europe's offer, which is being made for uh, partner countries across the world for connecting the world through investments and partnerships. And the main focus of the Global Gateway is to um, provide better living conditions for people and also to tackle global challenges. So this is particularly relevant, obviously, at the moment where we're facing, we've just come out of a pandemic and went straight into war. Um, the main focus of the Global Gateway, climate change, health, sustainable development, supply chains, and as you might uh, know, education and research are also um, included in the Global Gateway strategy. Underneath on this presentation, I've just put some of the sort of values approaches for Global Gateway, and you'll see there that's somehow um, echoing the conversation that we had in the first session, whereby what Europe is trying to do is to um, uh, project to a certain extent its values and its standards in its collaboration with, with partner countries. And I'd like you to see that, at least from the example that I'm giving you, is I work in the Africa Directorate. My, my uh, experience uh, over the past 10 years is with Africa. And um, at the last summit in February, we moved up 
this relationship we have, the partnership that we, the EU has with Africa um, to a new level, sort of a renewed partnership, uh, which is very much based on equal and mutual benefits on both sides. So at the summit, the Global Gateway Investment Package was uh, for Africa was, uh, was uh, proposed. Sorry, can you just go one slide back? I think I went too quickly there. Ah, no, no, okay, sorry. Um, Please go forward. All right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. The investment package, um, which was presented at the Africa EU summit, is a collaboration which brings together not only the European Commission but brings together member states also. As you know, um, Erasmus Plus is financing scholarship schemes, um, mobility collaboration, etc., with Africa with significant funding. Well, many member states also have programs with uh, with uh, member state uh, with uh, Africa, and what we want to put together is the offer that Europe as a whole is giving uh, to Africa. This will, on the one hand, increase our uh, impact in the country, will increase coherence and will also allow us to project sort of this uh, Europe as one and uh, Europe as a whole in partnership with Africa. One other element, and here it's, this is linked also to the inclusiveness dimension, is we want to bring stakeholders on board in this relationship so there'll be um, much more engagement with uh, stakeholder organisations, civil society, and in particular young people. Now, when we're thinking about the global challenges, climate, um, the pandemic, um, and all the societal challenges, young people have a very strong voice in that in that you know in that conversation and reflection africa is the youngest continent on 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 the on earth and is um very fast growing young population and they should have a role in this in 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 this conversation so there'll be a very strong engagement uh, there in the whole rollout of this investment package over the next um, uh, seven six seven years very strange. I can't find my second slide. I'm sorry. Huh? <laughs> There's a second slide, which is the slide, the one with the picture of the investment package, um, which is normally slide number three. Um, if perhaps the, the colleagues behind can just look at it. Um, but uh, what I wanted um, to illustrate is that we're not, um, the investment packages is um, obviously covering higher education, it's covering science, technology and innovation and research, but it's covering a whole um, uh, group of other sectors where higher education universities, um, universities across the member states can have a role in partnerships with Africa. We're talking in particular about the green transition. So we're talking in areas such as biodiversity, agri-food. We're looking at energy. There are going to be significant investments in transport across the continent. Now, if we're to make a difference, and in contrast to other uh, countries across the world in their collaboration with Africa. We want to look at the value chain as a whole. So it's not just a question about coming in there with hard, hard infrastructure. It's also about training people along the way. So if we're going to be investing across a corridor, uh, linking up regions of Africa together in terms of transport, in terms of renewable energy, etc., obviously there need to be the skills to go with it. What we're trying to do, at least in this um, partnership with Africa, is to uh, build up um, Africa's um, autonomy, um, sovereign autonomy, basically. And that is how this relationship needs to develop. And this is, I think, where the role of universities is, is that they can then contribute to developing the skills of the people along the way, can contribute through research, through uh, the, the partnerships, into responding to the challenges. For instance, just a last example, in the field of health, we have seen uh, the vaccine uh, difficulties that there were in Africa, Africa depending on the rest of the world to be able to um, uh, receive vaccines. Now there's a, there's, you know, a multilateral initiative in which the, the European Union is investing a lot, which is to build up Africa's capacity to 
uh, produce their um, vaccines themselves. And this will require research institutes and uh, universities in African countries to be able to skill up and uh, get involved in research. And it's here that we want to be able to see uh, universities in Europe accompany um, African partners along the way. Thank you. Um, some concrete measures or push so um, also in this inclusive approach um, also in the um, Africa continent or any other. Um, Hilde, um, next question would be um, for you if you could um, please um, highlight and share with us I mean what are your um, institutional approaches in regards to the cooperation in terms of uh, inclusive um, inclusivity and excellence and um, uh, what are the highlights of um, this in your aspect? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I would uh, love to do that. I think maybe you can go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to say two words about our agency um, because we have been through several mergers in the last few years, but uh, we are now a large agency uh, with a broad scope, um, which covers both higher education and higher vocational education and skills policy. And mostly concerned with domestic policy, but we also have a broad responsibility in, in internationalization. So that's sort of where we come from. Um, the program that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today, which uh, you'll see on the next slide, is called uh, our NORPART uh, program, and um, that was established in 2016 as a, as a partnership program. Um, it, uh, at that time, partially replaced the scholarship program that we had for the Global South and uh, East. Um, and um, the interesting part about it is that it's jointly financed by both the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, in our last call, which we completed last year, we awarded about 20 million euros to about 28 uh, projects. So we're not the biggest program in Europe, I don't think, but um, I think we can still be quite um, effective. And that um, you can see uh, on the next slide that it's um, a program that covers quite a large range of countries. Uh, so currently there are 40 eligible countries uh, in the program. And then um, lastly, I would uh, delve into the question that you asked. Um, of course, we did not specifically think about inclusiveness and excellence when we um, when we designed this program. But if you go to the next slide, I think I would want to touch upon some of the aspects of the program that I think um, illustrate some of these uh, dimensions. Um, as has been mentioned, um, and I'm sure is is equally important in many other programs, the NORPART program is um, contributes. Uh, the aim is to contribute to all aspects of the 2030 agenda and uh, particularly to the SDG 4, uh, 5 and, and 17. So we want the projects to be able to uh, show how they can contribute to, um, to the sustainable development goals. Uh, another inclusive uh, aspect of the program is, I think, the fact that it does cover uh, more than 40 countries in the global south. Uh, that is much broader than, for instance, the development policy of our own um, our own uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I think maybe broader than some other programs. Uh, but this reflects uh, highly reflects the the interest and the long-standing uh, links that many of our institutions have uh, to partners in the global south. Uh, and then the partnership program that ha uh, partnership model that has been mentioned by several is, of course, at the sort of basis of the program. And here, uh, the partner institution's uh, strategies, priorities, and needs uh, must inform um, and be and direct uh, how the projects are developed uh, within the NORPART portfolio. So it means that institutional ownership uh, and endorsement is very important uh, when um, when uh, collaborative uh, groups apply. Um, Another aspect I think that is um, speaks to inclusiveness is the strong focus on uh, student mobility, but uh, in this uh, respect also strong emphasis on mutual student mobility. So 
we want all our projects to include mobility also from uh, Norway to the global south. Uh, and it is an uh, expressed goal of the program that it should increase mobility in both directions uh, between Norway and, and the partner countries. Uh, but also, uh, uh, we want the projects to benefit um, the non-mobile students uh, and uh, through creating international learning environments. That's also very important. Uh, and, and, also, uh, through, and also to use digital means to achieve that. So in the last call, um, which came, of course, uh, towards the end of the pandemic, we opened up for more, uh, to, that more funds can go towards uh, developing of online learning, teaching and uh, training uh, packages. Um, when it comes to excellence, I think, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have a very strong focus on quality enhancement through cooperation and partnerships. Uh, and, and it's an express goal in this program that this quality enhancement should happen on both sides, uh, and thus uh, equal partnerships. So we expect that, uh, that the collaboration with the Global South also will benefit the Norwegian institution and will bring uh, something to the table uh, to both sides. Uh, and another aspect I think that is important is that the program is open to all subject areas so that we can sort of create excellence from the bottom up uh, and, we, and, and that excellence can be achieved and based on the individual institutions and, and researcher and researcher groups, their strengths and strategies um, and needs. Um, and then lastly, uh, it is a balancing act, I think, for us. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the program is funded uh, by two different ministries, and that means that we operate sort of in the intersection between higher education and development policies, and that uh, educational excellence is, is both a goal, but is also a tool to promote um, academic values, gender equality, and, and academic freedom. Um, I think I will stop there, and then we can talk more. Um, thank you, Hilde. Um, and um, you underlined some important elements, I think, regarding to the inclusivity um, to be balanced cooperation, to have balanced cooperation and to have mutual benefits. Um, this is an important aspect that without that probably we cannot achieve what um, their aims are. Um, Mateis, um, you are very much present in the MENA region. Um, could you share with us um, your first-hand experiences um, when it comes to the inclusion and excellence and what aspects do you think it could be taken on board also in, as an inspiration in European level? Yes, thank you Alenka uh, and uh, uh, th thank you for inviting me. Uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, attending digitally and uh, uh, in Brussels. Uh, before answering this question, uh, um, I would like to uh, briefly introduce our department and the programs, uh, uh, the main programs we, uh, we run. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, our uh, uh, NUFA Global Department uh, aims at strengthening uh, institutional uh, knowledge cooperation between uh, uh, institutes in the Netherlands and uh, uh, in countries uh, in development and transition. And uh, uh, NUFIC has done so uh, since its foundation in 1952. This year we uh, celebrate our 70th uh, anniversary. Uh, and we, we uh, uh, achieve the, try to achieve these goals by managing uh, different kinds of uh, uh, programs and uh, interventions, uh, which can be uh, institutional capacity building programs, uh, uh, tailor-made trainings, which are group trainings, uh, scholarship programs, and we have uh, uh, several uh, activities for alumni. And um, uh, yeah, we try to improve the knowledge and skills of uh, these organizations and uh, individuals and professionals uh, uh, around the world. And uh, the focus uh, of these programs is uh, on sustainable uh, uh, development and uh, making societal impact. Uh, two of our main uh, most important uh, funders of our programs are the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we run a program which is called the Orange Knowledge Program, which is a five-year-old, a five-year program uh, of around 220 million euro, uh, and we run it in 37 countries around the world. Uh, uh, I will uh, briefly describe that later on as well. And we also have some smaller program uh, programs uh, which we uh, which are funded by the European Union, uh, uh, specifically the Mandat Fund. Um, and talking about uh, next slide, please. Talking about 
uh, the latter program. Uh, we have two programs in uh, Jordan and Lebanon in the Middle East, um, uh, aiming at uh, improving uh, uh, opportunities and giving uh, educational opportunities to uh, vulnerable youth in these countries and to refugees uh, from Syria. Uh, so they have a, a better chance on, on uh, finding a job and uh, uh, having a, uh, building a future in the in their country or returning uh, eventually uh, to Syria. Uh, we do this uh, in uh, different collaborations. Uh, we have a consortium uh, uh, where we act in. Uh, in, in. In Jordan, this is a consortium of nine organizations, both local and uh, European organizations. And in Lebanon, uh, we have a project office uh, with, with the consortium uh, um, containing uh, two other uh, partner organizations, DAD and Campus France. Uh, the main focus of, of these, this program is uh, on skill development, and we also focus on the, the which we call the student pathway, which um, uh, tries to support uh, uh, individuals um, before entering uh, higher education, during um, uh, higher education, and uh, supporting them in uh, finding a job, having access to the labor market. Next slide, please. And the other program I mentioned, uh, uh, the Pro Orange Knowledge Program, uh, uh, focuses on uh, different uh, thematic areas, which are indicated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as uh, the main pri uh, policy priorities. Um, you can find these uh, these areas here. Uh, it's uh, food and nutrition security, everything related to water management and uh, climate and energy, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and security and rule of law which also reflect uh, several uh, aspects that have been mentioned in the presentations before of inclusion and excellence. And uh, I think this, uh, um, these inclusion and excellence elements uh, can also be uh, found back in our cross-cutting themes. Uh, specifically in the first one, inclusion, we try to, uh, with our programs, we try to uh, uh, especially focus on gender and marginalized vulnerable groups. Uh, but also digitalization uh, really entails uh, that you are including uh, people that uh, cannot access education. Uh, and the other aspects uh, as well as entrepreneurship, supporting uh, people to uh, access the labor market. And uh, yeah, entrepreneurship also uh, relates very much to the private sector development. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, uh, in sum, um, uh, how to answer the question of uh, how we approach in inclusion and excellence uh, in our programs. Uh, I firstly wanted to mention uh, our theory of change, which is the basis of uh, our Orange Knowledge program. And I think um, this theory of change really uh, breeds uh, inclusion and excellence. If you look at the impact we try to make, uh, you see uh, that we try to make inclusive, sustainable development. And how, how do we try to do that? Uh, you can see that in our mi mi midterm impact uh, by providing qualitative, relevant and accessible education systems by trying to, to, to strengthen these and also trying to, to strengthen partnerships, sustainable partnerships between persons and organizations, um, uh, which uh, eventually can result in uh, uh, better access to the labor market as well. Uh, if we dive into inclusion, um, it, I think it all starts with where you focus on. Uh, where, with our programs, we try to focus on specific target groups. So refugees, vulnerable youth, marginalized communities that don't have access to training programs, for instance, uh, in, 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 uh, to be present in capitals, uh, uh, women, and, and, all, and, uh, and furthermore, we try to focus on uh, which type of stakeholders do we want to reach. So not only management of institutions, but also their teachers, their students. So we, we try to uh, put on uh, these uh, inclusion uh, uh, glasses and uh, try to think, OK, what should we focus on? And furthermore, when we look at, um, uh, for instance, gender, um, uh, in our Orange, Orange Knowledge Program, we both focus on numbers and content. And what, what do I mean with that? Uh, for instance, uh, with our, uh, within the scholarships we provide to people in these 37 countries, uh, we, we, we um, we strive for uh, a minimum of 50% female participants. So that, uh, in that in that sense, uh, we focus on numbers. But I, I have the uh, the feeling that 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 is not enough. Only uh, selecting um, uh, enough 
people from a certain uh, marginalized group is not enough. So we also in our institutional collaboration projects and in our group trainings try to focus on gender as a as a topic. Uh, so how can we uh, uh, build uh, gender plans into the curricula or into the institutions uh, institutional systems so that in the future uh, uh, there will also be uh, attention to uh, several uh, uh, marginalized groups and that they will also feel included. So for instance, in Iraq, uh, we have a project with six, the six institutions and uh, we try to develop together with them and together with the Dutch uh, uh, knowledge institution, um, uh, tailor-made gender plans that will really work for these six institutions and they can differ per institution. Uh, so we do a strength weakness analysis uh, and we try to sustainably embed them in uh, the curricula and the systems of these um, institutions. But when, when we talk about excellence, uh, I think uh, I've touched upon uh, uh, several aspects which has been have been uh, referred to as well in the other presentations. But I also wanted to mention that uh, we, we, we focus on several levels of creating uh, sustainability of interventions. So there can be a sustainable financial sustainability. How can an institution financially be sustained? But there, there can also be uh, educational sustainability, which I uh, briefly mentioned as well. So in our curricula, how can we uh, make sure that in the, in the years after a project, uh, we look after certain people? Um, uh, all these kinds of levels of uh, in, uh, sustainability we try to uh, focus on. Um, uh, as I also mentioned, uh, uh, for instance, the, the student pathway where we focus on in the MENA region with our EU programs. We try to remove barriers for people, uh, barriers that they, before they couldn't uh, uh, get over. Uh, now, uh, because of our support, we try to help them uh, uh, with that soft skill development, for instance. Uh, the thematic areas, which I also uh, explained about, is also uh, about uh, how can we provide the best quality. Uh, then there's the subject of equal partnerships, which is a very challenging subject as well. But um, uh, within our program, we try to aim for equal partnerships. But that, that means a lot, equal partnerships. So. Um, Equality is it can be financial equality. So uh, do we have enough financial means to do the same? But it can also be ma managerial uh, equality. So we don't only want to give the, the, the power to the Dutch uh, uh, knowledge institutions to run a program, but we want them to run it together. So uh, when uh, uh, institutions uh, write a proposal, uh, when we have launched a, a call in a, in a certain country, um, uh, we ask them to write the proposal together. So there is a part uh, which should be written by the Dutch partner, but also a part written by the local partners. So that's how we uh, strive for uh, equality, but it's still a, a challenging job. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, alignment uh, within and between programs and donors is very important. I think um, if uh, you don't know about what, what's happening uh, around you in a certain country or region, it's very difficult to make, uh, make a difference. Uh, so that's why we have to stay connected to all our stakeholders and know what, th what they do and within our own program also make sure that they uh, are building on each other and not uh, uh, doing the same uh, job twice. So that's uh, more or less uh, uh, what I uh, want to say about uh, inclusion and ec uh, excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthijs. Um, so equality is another important element of um, this um, inclusive excellence approach. Um, so Lloyd, um, now we come to you. Um, Caesar is well known for representing and supporting best higher education institutions. And how do you see these increasing attentions they are putting also on the uh, inclusivity um, in global partnerships? Um, are there any specific points that um, you think you should be also considered in regards to the European policies in this regard? Sure. Thanks, Alenka. Uh, thanks for the question. Thanks to ACA as well for uh, inviting us here today. Um, I hope you'll let me uh, bring the conversation back a little bit closer to Europe now. Um, um, perhaps I can start by um, addressing your assessment of our uh, HEIs. Um, so we're a network of 57 universities, uh, together the strong and united voice of uh, universities of science and technology in Europe. And we're what I like to call a pan-European association. So um, our membership is not tied to being based in an EU country, uh, but instead more around sharing uh, an interest in Europe, but with a global outlook. 
Uh, we cover universities from 28 different countries across the EU, also in Israel, Norway, Serbia, Switzerland, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. Um, and each of them, they occupy um, a leading position in their regional context uh, and their country and beyond. Uh, some are comprehensive, some are specialized. Um, so one of our strengths really is how our membership combines uh, excellence with geographic diversity. Um, so what of the global pillar of uh, the European strategy for universities, for example? Well, the Commission's uh, communication from January states that the strategy will support universities in becoming more outward looking and competitive on the global scene. So that's the excellence part and in contributing to the strengthening of higher education systems in partner countries. So that's the, the kind of inclusion part that we're talking about today. Uh, looking at this, I would like to bring back into the conversation, we heard about it earlier, uh, the idea of brain circulation or uh, what we like to call talent circulation at CESA. Um, so it's not just about physical brains inside people's heads, moving from country to country, but also about kind of the portability of ideas and concepts spreading from the EU as it aspires to be the leader in uh, global education and research uh, far beyond its borders. So this global pillar cannot be achieved without attracting some of the best and brightest from Europe's universities uh, to Europe's universities from outside as well, um, especially those from disadvantaged backgrounds. A well-planned strategy should see a boost in career perspectives for talented young researchers from countries with less of an academic tradition, uh, which then brings in an individual level to the inclusivity as well, uh, on top of the wider geographic scope that I referred to. Um, well, that's all very well said, but when we dig deeper, does the strategy truly have a worthy global dimension? I think it's clear that last month's council conclusions based on the uh, strategy, based on the communication, uh, push back slightly on the commission's ambitions. Um, our association in its position paper before the council um, uh, meeting advocated the European higher education area, which I'm sure obviously you all know very well, and the Bologna process associated with it are the solid foundation on which existing comparability in the standards and quality assurance of higher education qualifications is built. Uh, and we advocate that any joint European degrees and any other initiatives uh, in this area should build on this existing framework. So we therefore welcome the ministers uh, demonstrating their commitment to what already exists. But there is still wider scope for a truly global perspective in there as well. Uh, both the Commission's communication and the Council's conclusions revealed little ambition on a broader than EU and EEA perspective. Uh, EEA in the economic sense, not in the education sense. Uh, for the four flagship initiatives which were part of that paper. Nevertheless, the accent and the strategy placed on uh, uh, places on researchers at risk is most welcome. Um, at the time of the Commission's communication back in January, uh, we didn't realise just how relevant this pledge and uh, parallel call to EU uh, member states would be just a few short weeks later. Four million refugees from Ukraine are trying now to build lives in the EU as we speak. Many of them students and academics who are, again, following COVID, uh, learning online and or being integrated into an institution far away from their home. Partly with thanks to the flexibility shown by the Commission, of course, in its uh, response to the invasion. It's also welcome to see an emphasis on building or maybe better said strengthening bridges in the section uh, drivers of Europe's global role and leadership. It acknowledges that Europe needs to reach out more to the rest of the world, even if the intense focus on selected strategic partner countries, although understandable, it has to, of course, um, go in line with the EU's um, perspectives, um, does not always fall hand in hand with developments and desires uh, in academic circles with existing complexity surrounding funding for specific regions, of course, likely to continue. So reciprocity is key here to fostering truly balanced ex uh, exchanges where those who participate in mobility programs uh, can increasingly act as multipliers both at home and host institutions, uh, both in Europe and uh, further afield. And allow me as well to give a special mention to Erasmus Plus alumni from around the world who do an amazing job in communicating the benefits of international mobility and promoting the need for ever more inclusivity in, and diversity in academia. So with not much more concretely on a supposed global pillar for the strategy, um, allow me now to turn our attention to the global dimension of Erasmus Plus with the message that all of, the, all of these actions should be intertwined with the strategy to make it a global success. 
Uh, firstly, it's a bit of a shame that our previous call back in 2020 for the Erasmus Plus 2021 to 27 budget to reach 46 billion euro to support this step up in cooperation and therefore a more globally inclusive program uh, wasn't achieved. As we know as well, the existing budget is just over 26 billion euro and suffers from being backloaded towards the end of the programming period. Ironically, now our members are telling us that leftover funds from the COVID pandemic are subsidizing a lot of the ambitions at this early stage of the programming cycle. There's a, there are a few more technical aspects which I would go into, but I think we're a little bit short for time. So um, are we okay? Can I go into them? Yeah, okay, great. So um, we also have the opening up of Key Action 131, uh, which is, of course, the classic Erasmus exchanges that we, that we think of, you know, students going to and from universities and staff as well, uh, to non-programme countries. And this has been welcomed by our members. Um, the 20% budget limit uh, appears to be sufficient, provided that for Key Action 171, so that's the successor to international credit mobility, um, also becomes available. Um, which we really do hope will be the case uh, whilst the post-pandemic appetite to revitalise international exchange is on the rise again. Allowing funding under Key Action 131 for income and mobility should also be considered for specific global regions, perhaps drawing inspiration from the approach with the widening countries under Horizon Europe or the rules already established under the international credit mobility. And our members, of course, you, you, we often hear this a lot, but they um, would appreciate increased flexibility in where uh, their staff and students can go on exchange to and also where they can come from. And uh, a quick word as well on Erasmus Mundus Joint Masters. The new funding model is welcomed. Uh, it provides a clear incentive for attracting additional students beyond uh, traditional grant holders through a lack of um, sorry, although uh, the lack of clear ceiling or reference point for consortium level tuition fees can complicate coordination among mem uh, partners. So the adaptive rule on the geographical spread of uh, Erasmus Mundus Joint Master Scholarship holders, which is 10% maximum from the same country, uh, may also be unnecessarily complicated to recruiting uh, high quality students from around the world. Uh, and now the design measures actions, it's also welcomed, uh, but the application process is disproportionate uh, for the level of funding involved. And of course, uh, we're trying to get rid of those um, administrative burdens. And uh, when you have the, the, these kinds of extra rules coming in, it, it's not always uh, easy to achieve that. Uh, clarifications are already needed as well on the priority for uh, states and institutions which are not involved in Erasmus Mundus already. So that goes... Uh, into kind of the guidance documents and all of those kinds of technicalities. Um, so I'll zoom back out now to kind of like the higher perspective, uh, if you'll let me conclude with three main points. Uh, firstly, the EU's ambitions should be open and leading the way rather than closed and running behind. Uh, secondly, uh, a modern understanding of excellence includes recognizing the strength that diversity brings, which I think uh, everybody here today has, has pretty much uh, got on board with. And thirdly, uh, and this is a bit awkward as a British person, but um, swiftly associating uh, Switzerland and the UK with Horizon Europe uh, really is a must if the EU is serious about being a global leader and uh, creating those partnerships with uh, like-minded countries. And I really do believe that there is a lot more that uh, unites us than divides us. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you also all four of you to be so much on time that um, uh, we would now be happy to take any questions from the public either um, do we have anybody okay um, so maybe at the end of the next round um, so um, we would now uh, tackle more the topic of the science or knowledge diplomacy and uh, Deidre to you a question um, how do you see the role of um, knowledge diplomacy in an international context um, I mean and how this could help um, for maybe blocks of countries where there might be um, internally a smooth cooperation but externally much more difficult one <clears throat> I think that was, this is quite the, the um, science diplomacy, knowledge diplomacy would have been particularly helpful, I think, during the negotiation of the joint declaration at the Africa-EU summit. So we had heads of state on both sides, the commission sort of negotiating the, the joint declaration and the sensitive points 
were um, health, obviously the pandemic, but in particular in relation to intellectual property and the TRIPS waiver uh, in relation to the vaccine. So that, that was a sensitive issue for Africa. They felt that Europe wasn't doing enough on the um, uh, World Trade Organization front and, you know, sort of um, helping them advance on, on their agenda. Um, the other sensitive point was on um, green transition. Now, it's very good to go to Africa and talk about a green transition, but they're not there yet. So they need a just transition. And that is their clear message to us as Europeans. And that's sort of the text that came out of the... Uh, in, the, in the joint declaration. And there, as I mentioned before, their sovereign autonomy are fundamental. Now, these are areas um, which could be facilitated, or at least we wouldn't come to the 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, in a negotiation, if there was more sort of um, uh, understanding up front uh, between, between Europe and, uh, and the partners. I think it's also very clear that there's a big disconnect between universities and governments and states. If we look at um, universities and university partnerships, the collaboration projects, you have no issue with your partners. You're, you're working together in a particular academic area. It's flowing, it's good, regardless of the problems behind. But then there's always this kind of discourse that comes um, up in different arenas, for instance, on the on the curriculum with Africa, you know, the colonial curriculum, uh, you know, Europe coming. These kind of discourses are at a different level. Or, um, I'm, I'm, for instance, the Chinese influence also, you know, the, the differences in Europe's way of interacting and, uh, and China's way of interacting. I think a lot of... Um, a lot of this could be helped. Um, for instance, just after the summit, um, it, um, then there was the invasion of Ukraine. And um, at the General Assembly, we were quite surprised. And we'd just come out of a summit where Europe and Africa had sort of committed to a renewed partnership, but there were significant numbers of African countries that had either abstained or um, uh, rejected the declaration uh, condemning uh, the invasion of... Uh, so, you know, sort of, this is when, you know, I think universities and university collaboration and working and bringing this up to a, a higher level and engaging with ministries. Um, I come from both worlds, and so I come from the Erasmus and I'm seeing now here. I think more can be done uh, between universities here in Europe and universities in Africa, whereby you as partners go together and knock on the doors of the ministries in the partner countries of the EU delegations. And you say, look at what we're doing. We're working in the field of agri-food. Uh, agri-food is uh, critical at the moment. This is what Europe can offer. This is what this collaborative partnership between uh, University X and University Y in Africa is actually doing much more awareness, I think, is needed there. And that will help stop this big gap in, in discourse. OK, thank, thank you. you. So as we heard in the first panel, university in each of the yeah. delegation. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, Lloyd, um, also Caesar's position papers uh, refer to the um, uh, this pr principles of science democracy and um, could you share us, I mean, with us how this is, um, how do your network see this is working out, especially um, taking on board the, uh, the concepts as we also heard it in the first panel, I mean, and it's for in the European documents like um, EU strategic autonomy, and on the other hand, also being open as possible and close as necessary. So how yes, do this? Exactly. So at CESA, we like to talk of uh, universal values rather than European values. Uh, not that they're opposed, but um, we don't see them as like kind of being uh, exclusive to Europe. So the focus should be on what unites us as a global community and not really on what separates us. Uh, these universal values are enshrined in our association. Uh, they're rooted in sustainable peace and prosperity, respect for the rule of uh, law and human rights, democratic citizenship, evidence-based policy making, and free circulation of knowledge as laid down in agreements, not only by the European Union, but also by the United Nations. So you can see where this kind of more global uh, perspective comes into to our idea. 
Uh, the idea of united in diversity, the EU's motto, of course, since 2000 is clearly not exclusive to the European Union itself. Um, but at the same time, we can't be naive, of course. Uh, Putin's ongoing war of aggression uh, against Ukraine and its people underlines that agreements can be broken with bridges, burnt, uh, with bridges which have been built over decades burnt down uh, in an instant. The universal values we champion come into uh, question during these moments. Uh, and conflict and war clearly continue uh, to pose enormous local and global challenges uh, which jeopardize um, global security. So the traction around increasing EU strategic autonomy cannot mean reducing the autonomy of our researchers and the universities that they uh, work at. In contrast, it should empower them to build up and to maintain bridges across cultures, countries, continents and conflicts. That is why we're so focused on stepping up global cooperation, because there is far more that unites us than divides us in, in advancing our societies. But, there is, but this is nowhere more true than international cooperation, science, technology and academia, where these four areas all meet. Our universities exist to conduct excellent science and develop cutting edge technology, which educate the next generations, including our future leaders. They nurture independence of thought and assure ethical academics who foster trust in academia throughout society. So we really must may, remain committed to scientific integrity, academic freedom and institutional autonomy more than ever in these testing times. Meanwhile, governments and international organisations must empower these uh, academics and their institutions uh, who are the very people who take on the responsibility of advancing our societies. The authorities must be thoughtful and nuanced whilst applying discretion and due diligence. And they must refrain from sanctioning academics and students solely on the basis of nationality. And uh, I'm really pleased to hear some of the, the positive uh, words surrounding individual mobility being able to continue uh, there. Only this way will we, we maintain genuine connections and cooperation where they still exist, whilst politics and war play out in the foreground. These reflections lead, uh, led us to propose four guiding principles in, uh, in our position paper on uh, a framework for uh, global cooperation in science and technology, bearing in mind the recent developments. And we were actually developing this paper before the, the war and uh, when this, uh, bef when this uh, came in, we, re we couldn't ignore it. We really had to get uh, the, the, this angle in there as well. So firstly, adhering to the universal values that I referred to earlier, uh, practically we can and in some cases do already see in this gener uh, in generous financial support and simplified administrative procedures that there are ways of helping those who are affected by conflict and war, fleeing from both oppressor and aggressor regimes. Uh, those bridges really need to be maintained and strengthened. Secondly, we must put global goals at the centre of global cooperation and promotes openness in achieving them. We encourage the EU to lead by example through being as open as possible with global partners. Thirdly, the EU framework programme for research and innovation and related programmes are key for reaching out to global partners who share universal values. We must join forces to, ta uh, to tackle local and global challenges and this must remain their focus. The EU institutions should support universities and academics to carry out their own risk benefit analyses, including on foreign interference. And finally, I would like to quote our Secretary General, who has declared that now is the worst time for petty squabbles. I reiterate, I reiterate that we strongly believe that the EU must seek and cherish its close allies in science and technology, including, of course, Switzerland and the UK, among many others. What does that mean in practice? that the British government, the Swiss government and the EU institutions should come to a swift agreement on re-association to Horizon Europe and Erasmus+. Plus. Further integrating the Western Balkans and Eastern partnership countries must be high on the agenda as well. Meanwhile, we are hearing of uh, Horizon Association exploratory talks for Canada, New Zealand, South Korea, even negotiations coming up now in the middle of this year. So when it wishes to be, the EU can be ambitious in both the depth and geographic scope of its partnerships in our field. Whilst here in Europe, our association has had to be active in a campaign called Stick to Science, the campaign for an open and inclusive European research area. 
So I encourage all of you listening uh, to join the 5,000 people and 280 organisations who have already signed up as supporters to show how we all want to put science and technology cooperation before politics. Uh, that's me, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Lord. Um, Hilde, um, what do you think, um, what would be the role, or what is the role of the European cooperation schemes um, in collaboration with the Global South? Um, we saw that you are already very much involved in this region, but uh, still, what, I mean, other potential mm. that is there still? Yes. Um, First, I would like to say that we need both uh, nationally funded programs and the EU uh, funded program. But we, I think we also need to see more uh, coordination and synergy between the programs. And I think an even stronger emphasis on co-creation and the needs of our partners in the global south. I think we do still have a ways to go, um, partially because we are also bound by our national policies and strategies. Another um, area or point I would like to make is that I think we should aim for more flexibility in our program design. Um, in the changing international landscape, it necessitates uh, it, um, but um, uh, unfortunately, again, the reality of the frameworks and the conditions under which the programs are created often makes it difficult. Um, uh, there are visa regulations and there are many, many practical hindrances uh, that makes that kind of flexibility also difficult. I think we often can show more flexibility in managing the projects, uh, uh, but it's uh, harder to be flexible and responsive at the program level. And also, it's maybe sometimes harder to have a really long-term perspective uh, in the things that we do, and we should really aim for that. Um, I would also like to um, see maybe a stronger focus on uh, institutional cooperation and, and uh, capacity building. Um, uh, not to say that we don't need uh, individual scholarship schemes, but I think that it's important to focus on the capacity building of, of the institutions. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the world that we live in now with the conflicts and the crisis that we um, uh, are experiences currently in, in, in different parts of the world also uh, shows us that institutional collaboration sometimes is difficult in these conflict areas. And in that respect, maybe um, individual uh, scholarships uh, is, is most definitely needed. And uh, uh, somebody mentioned also the students and academics at risk and refugees. And these are um, groups that we should pay um, particular attention to and have programs for. Uh, and then last, I would like to point out that I think we also need to be more conscious of uh, sustainability in, in cooperation. I think both in terms of climate change and the impact and longevity of the project results. Uh, for instance, um, we need to maybe encourage longer stays when traveling longer distances. Uh, and also I think we could encourage more South to South cooperation um, and finance that as well in our programs. I think I will stop there and maybe there'll be some questions. Um, thank you. Um, I would also agree that capacity building was one important mechanism. I mean, to, it has to be the system development as well as individual support, I mean, to really um, advance in this regard. Um, Mateis, um, what are your good practices or maybe challenges that um, you experienced um, in funding schemes that you already are implementing? quite um, a lot, actually, in the um, regions, uh, as you described before, um, and how are those related to inclusion and excellence, of course? Uh, thank you, Alenka. Um, to start with my um, um, view on the good practices, there's a small echo uh, here, by the way. Um, wh when I think of the good practices, uh, uh, I also think of that we continuous, uh, continuously target uh, specific knowledge gaps. We target uh, uh, specific uh, target groups. Um, uh, at the beginning of the program, we do that by developing country plans of implementation. So per country, we look at, and, and per region, we look at which knowledge gaps are there. And they mainly, we mainly try to fit them in the four priority areas uh, that, uh, that I described before, like food and nutrition security, uh, security and rule of law. Um, 
Another uh, thing that uh, can be considered a good practice uh, of our programs is that uh, they are um, both tailor made and they are integrated with each other, as I briefly mentioned before as well. Uh, we tried, we have tailor made trainings, which are uh, uh, group trainings where we specifically see uh, what a certain organization or department or a combination of organization needs in which specific areas. Uh, furthermore, we work locally. We have uh, uh, several uh, NUFIC offices worldwide that uh, promote uh, uh, education um, uh, and exchange uh, between uh, scholars. Uh, and we also work in consortia, as I, as I mentioned. So this, these collaborations are very uh, important uh, for us So we, uh, because we learn a lot from other uh, organizations' uh, approaches. Um, uh, Furthermore, we, uh, we apply a, a regional approach where possible. So um, uh, we, uh, we have several regional managers uh, within our department. Uh, I'm one of them uh, focusing on the, the Middle East uh, region, uh, where we uh, uh, on a weekly basis get together and uh, share our views on, on the different regions and uh, which approach do we apply and is it logical that we, that we do so. So we're trying to learn a lot from that. And also within our programs, uh, we try to uh, uh, have uh, calls for uh, regional uh, pro projects. So um, organizations in different countries uh, um, are stimulated to, to work together and uh, find new networks. Uh, so that's something uh, I'm uh, particularly proud of uh, within our program. Uh, furthermore, we also work with uh, co-funding. So uh, when we launch a, a, a project, uh, we ask the, the, the local partners, the thousand partners, uh, if they uh, are, are able to co-fund. And this is also dependent on the, the economic status of the country. So in uh, uh, middle income countries, we uh, uh, ask them to, uh, to have their share in, uh, in the project because that creates ownership and reciprocity. So I think that's an important element as well to, uh, to stress here. But of course, uh, in, uh, uh, while implementing uh, our programs, there are lots of uh, challenges as well, uh, which we encounter. And uh, the topics I mentioned are uh, uh, very diverse and uh, uh, can be considered both good practices, but sometimes also a, a challenge. Um, uh, when we think of inclusion, uh, for instance, what, uh, what we're talking about uh, uh, all day uh, uh, today, um, the, the inclusion of some people uh, means exclusion uh, of other people. So when you focus on a certain target group, including a certain target group, this could mean that you are excluding other target groups. So you have to be aware of that. And that's sometimes a very dis difficult exercise because uh, why do you decide to uh, include uh, certain target groups and others not? Uh, furthermore, uh, we also try to uh, strive for uh, equality and partnerships, but that uh, is a, a very uh, difficult uh, challenge as well uh, because um, uh, what we hear sometimes from our partner that it's difficult to uh, to have total equality in decision making um, when sometimes a, a grant amount is partly paid to a Dutch partner um, that institution that, that receives the the money um, and yeah uh, unconsciously maybe can feel that they they can they can do a bit more than the, they they would like to do um, so uh, we have to really take care uh, of that aspect. Uh, and, and make sure that the sovereign partners are also feeling as responsible and uh, uh, as equal in the decision making. Uh, and furthermore, there's also financial equality, which I uh, briefly mentioned as well. Um, uh, how can we make sure that uh, people in, uh, uh, in, in certain countries are also paid for their work? Because we need to learn from, from sovereign partners as well. And uh, when uh, People at the universities give lectures. They should be paid for it within our program, uh, but that that sometimes is a challenge challenge because of our legal framework in our program. But we try to uh, uh, find ways that, that fit within that legal framework and that also uh, fit within uh, uh, that financial equality goal. But that, that's uh, sometimes a challenge. And uh, last but not least, uh, um, it's sometimes uh, uh, automatically uh, uh, created that um, we work in silos instead of le regional collaboration. Uh, because maybe sometimes we don't know about uh, what happens in other countries or in the same country, uh, especially. So it's always a challenge to connect as many uh, uh, people and organizations to each other as possible to make sure uh, people work together instead of uh, in silos. Uh, yes, that's about it.
Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions from the public? Online? No? Okay, physically. Um, okay, then, oh, yeah. We do have. Um, just to thank uh, the speakers for the excellent presentations and this um, beautiful global engagement uh, of the programs. Uh, there is this notion of Team Europe, which I like a lot, that maybe you could elaborate on just a little. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, Team Europe is an approach um, whereby um, the EU funding and the member states' efforts funding are put together in a partner country. So um, let's start at a uh, national level, a partner country level. We'll take, uh, for instance, Senegal. The government of Senegal has identified a series of um, three, four um, priority areas, and member states discuss who would have the best expertise in that particular area and who'd be willing to contribute. And the EU does the same. That's discussed together. And basically the effort is shared. If a particular member state present in Senegal doesn't feel it has uh, um, uh, expertise uh, or interest in agriculture, they might choose you know, to focus on an another area or another country. Then, um, Doing that also um, sort of you bring in different means of funding because the member states have certain means of funding, the EU has others. And the fact that you have brought um, a bigger packet of funding together will generate other funding. So then you're going into innovative funding, blending, guarantees, etc. What that, al what that also does is um, increase the coherence, um, so you don't have the silo sort of effect with uh, people not being aware of what the other's doing. And that's where I see the role of the universities and where they can tap in and where you as agencies should be able to sort of engage uh, there. because you have uh, member states have their um, embassies which are there in some cases um, member states have um, development agencies development agencies have uh, expertise but to a limited extent whereby i think they would very much appreciate if the higher education agencies uh, can come in and bring in european universities and and that, I think, will, is a complete change of mindset from the pure technical assistance type efforts that were made before. So we have developments in Europe, the European universities, whereby universities are coalescing, are sharing, mutualizing, um, seeing who is best on what area, who can advance. And we'll bring that in um, into your collaboration um, be it through Erasmus, be it through, there'll be the Intra-Africa Mobility Program, uh, the, the, there's RISE, there's Marie Curie, there's, so you can do that anyway through the programs that exist already, but also this kind of conversation should be taking place also for the Team Europe initiatives, the big ones, the ones that are taking place at national and at regional level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I have my own, yeah, I, I keep on forgetting. Um, um, as we have a few minutes more, I would also have a question mainly for Matej, Matej to you and to Hilde, as you're also acting as a national agency um, for Erasmus Plus as well. I mean, how to start? I mean, I, I will, um, this is a question that, for example, I'm from Slovenia, and um, of course, for the Western Balkan region, collaboration is established, and I mean, this is a region that everybody has interest and um, no problems on how to implement or use the opportunities also within the Erasmus program. But on the other side, we have um, African continent with no established link within the institutions before. And if you want to use the funds that are available through the program, you need to have some kind of links. And we have many administrative obstacles, no additional funds. I mean, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not even for education, are giving extra funds. I mean, how to do? Because, I mean, in a way we promote 
this cooperation, but without previous links, you cannot have a successful partnership or, I don't know, cooperation. So, I mean, what would you, your reflections would be on, I mean, what would be the first steps, the best to be done? So, Mateis or Hilde, I mean, would Hilde, would uh, you like to go first? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, of course, I think uh, to succeed in these programs, you need to have um, a, sort of an established relationship with uh, your counterparts uh, in the global south. But uh, for instance, that we see, and, and because we also have the programs in the same uh, department, we see that some of our national programs, I mentioned NORPART, but we also have had another one called Eurasia, which has been towards the Eastern Partnership countries and the, and the Central Asia region. We see that these programs can prepare um, um, uh, consortia also to apply for EU funding, the capacity building dimension of the, the Erasmus Plus program, for instance. And it also can, um, they can also extend uh, the, the, um, the nationally funded programs through uh, uh, the global, uh, through um, uh, KA uh, 171, the, the international credit mobility schemes, uh, so that when the, the projects are coming towards an end, they can they can continue it. But I think also sometimes the, the uh, international credit mobility scheme can also be a way to test out relationships that can continue and be, be something more later on. So we see that sort of uh, go bo both ways. And so I think there is uh, potential for synergy between the nationally funded programs uh, and um, and EU funded programs. But uh, in the end, I think many of these relationships that succeed have a long standing relationships, uh, often uh, research relationships um, and 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 yeah, so we don't do matchmaking, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Matei? Yes, thank you, Alenka. Um, when I think of this question, uh, I think it's it's all about visibility. People need to know that uh, uh, what what you are doing to be able to think, OK, can I maybe uh, uh, join in some way. Uh, so what we try to do is uh, we have a, a, a large alumni network all over the world uh, of people that um, have studied in the Netherlands or uh, have uh, something, uh, have collaborated with Dutch partners in their country uh, or at their university. So that's a good starting point. Uh, we always try to invite as many stakeholders as possible that are uh, linked to the uh, specific topics that are discussed during alumni events. So we organize several alumni events uh, uh, per year in uh, in different countries. But we also organize regional uh, alumni events. For instance, we had uh, uh, two years ago, we had one in uh, in uh, Thailand uh, for uh, for Asian partners. Uh, and we will have one now uh, beginning of June in, uh, in, in Jordan, uh, focusing on alumni of the uh, entire Middle East uh, region. So uh, joining these events is uh, maybe a first step to get to know uh, uh, the programs and to get to know which opportunities are there. But we also uh, uh, stay continuously in contact with uh, with embassies, of course, and we hear uh, from them which uh, um, uh, target groups there are that we could uh, also address with our programs. Um, yeah, there are several more ways in which we operate, but th these are uh, two of the elements uh, uh, which uh, could be uh, uh, highlighted. Okay, thank you very much. You have a question? Okay, yeah. so please. Um, I just had a quick, uh, quick reaction, if I may, uh, listening to Hilde, who brought up again this word of, of synergies, who used to be a buzzword uh, in Brussels circles about two years ago, I think, when we were discussing um, heatedly the launch of the new programs. And we used it a lot uh, in the sense of synergies between education and, and research funding in, in particular. I think it's still a very relevant world today that we might want to start applying also when it comes to um, global cooperation and the outlining of different strategies and objectives. Um, certainly synergies between national level funding and, and European level funding, but also between the different strategies that we actually 
also mentioned today. Um, with our event, we focused very much on the European strategy for universities, but we know of the global approach strategy for research. We've heard just now in this, um, this session about the global gateway strategy. And I think, Lloyd, you've brought that up as well. There are also strategies with slightly different objectives and certainly colliding principles when it comes to global cooperation. So probably as a way forward, we need those, um, uh, those collisions to be addressed as well. And then we probably need also for them to be reflected in in a better way, uh, the different uh, parts of the European Commission work um, together to um, to address them. So it's more common to you, Didre, because I think you're the only uh, representative of the European Commission left with us in the in the, in the panel. <laughs> That's the downside of standing until the end. Uh, and I think it's it, it's a, it's it's a point you've heard many times before. But it struck me that we need that probably more than ever, also in the global uh, context. Thank you. If I may, I, I agree totally with you. When you think about it, um, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, universities were quite um, uh, fluent in looking for European funding going from the, you know, the education programs, the research programs, FP, whatever, one, two, um, but also regional funds, structural funds, etc. Well, it's a little bit the same sort of principle you know, it, it's looking to see where where universities can position themselves and then support their mission through the different, you know, types of financing available, be it European, be it their own member state, be it development funding, be it uh, education funding. I think the first thing is to look at the mission of um, of the institution, look at the education research missions, look at look, look at your global mission, and then see what can support that best. And then, but then needs to be this dialogue done also at national level, so that the strengths can be brought out, the strengths of the different institutions, um, and then that should be brought into a conversation with the partner country. Uh, you know, the university should be working at the bottom, but I think member states should be also working above that and having a conversation with their counterparts uh, in the global south, for instance. And that will that will help sustainability. It'll it'll help effectiveness and such like. I'm not sure if I, <laughs> I've answered the question, but in the Commission services, we're talking a lot more than before. So uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that will help. <laughs> so there is a light in, at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, thank you very much uh, for all the panelists for this excellent discussion, and uh, for participants. Just allow us a few minutes for technical change of the some of the panelists because <laughs> I understood <laughs> your stay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much and um, see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.
I can see you again. Oh, sorry. So that seems we can we can start. Yeah. So technically we're there, but not humanely. There is a bit. Uh, uh, the title of this concluding panel is Taking Europe's Global Cooperation in Higher Education and Research Forward, Key Takeaways for Policy and Practice. And we've got a total of 30 minutes for that, uh, which is a daunting uh, task. Uh, but uh, I had the privilege to not bear it alone, uh, but to have uh, three experts with me uh, to tell me and you uh, uh, what are uh, the key takeaways for policy and practice? So when I came here uh, this afternoon, I was puzzled uh, if um, what is inclusive excellence or ex excellent inclusive it, inclusivity, uh, I'm still puzzled, but on a higher level, uh, which, uh, which is already uh, a step forward. Uh, and I would like to start with asking all of you the same question and then follow up with separate questions for, for each of you according to your areas of expertise. Before I do that, I, n I need not introduce Deirdre because he has just been introduced and I n probably do not need to introduce uh, Michael and Pete uh, because you all know them. Uh, but just to remember you, uh, Pete is the Vice President of the European Association of International Education. And Michael Gebel is and has been for some time, I think, the Director of the Higher Education Policy Unit at the European University Association, EUA. So my first question is basically, yeah, uh, if you think what you didn't know uh, at 1 p.m. today and what you do now, uh, what are the one or two takeaways uh, uh, you would offer within four minutes? Let's start with you, Deirdre. <laughs> um, what I know is that I'm still trying to adjust to my new role. <laughs> that's, I think that's quite, that's quite clear. Um, I think... <coughs> I've learned, and I'm not sure I should say that, but I think the sometimes putting policy on paper, you can lose some of the nuances. And um, what I've heard, what I've heard and what we've said on occasions is sort of excellence is Europe and inclusiveness is de facto everything you're doing outside in developing world. And, and that isn't, how I think we should be approaching this. I think excellence is everything that universities can do to solve society's challenges, uh, be it themselves individually or be it in partnership, and be it in partnership regardless of who the partner is. Um, it could be a partner in the developing South. That's excellence. Uh, for me, excellence is also um, university working outside its strict territory, working with the private sector, working with the public sector, working with the community, etc. So these kind of processes, this, this, um, this way of working is excellence. And inclusiveness for me is making sure that you are bringing in everybody who needs to be brought on board for whatever purpose and 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 that's yeah so so it's not um europe versus the world if you if you see what i mean um i think that's the message we should be um passing to our universities thank you uh, that's a very good point and uh, it came also to my mind that perhaps we need to redefine excellence uh, uh, not just uh, inclusiveness uh, so michael what would be the one or two takeaways you would offer yeah i think I think I can just follow up there, and, um, and we start. Somebody said this often, and there's an oxymoron: yeah, yeah, excellent and inclusion. And I think this is 
probably true. I mean, if you look at the higher education institution, I mean, historically that has been defined by exclusion rather than by inclusion. And there are exceptions, but this is how we looked at it. And now, I mean, things have changed. I mean, there's an ES, uh, ESDG, which basically says it has to be inclusive, provide for all. This is a major change. Um, a few years ago, I just remembered about 10 years ago, if you put into your search machine access and inclusion in higher education, it came out that this was about physically challenged people and giving them access. So we moved quite a way, what I try to say, we moved quite a way forward. We made a lot of progress in um, both, I think, at policy and institutional level. I think uh, Deirdre's um, observation was right in that we talked about um, collaborating with Africa as inclusion, yeah, um, but we also talked about working in Europe, being active in Europe as a matter of inclusion. I think what we probably have to, what we used to hear quite a lot, we have been, we are excellent as an institution, so we can't be inclusive, you know, you can't do the same. And I think this is a bit more difficult to find. I wouldn't exclude that you still meet somebody at a European university who says this. But um, I think uh, this has changed. We're much closer to society, focus more on societal needs. Um, you could still be, I think, provocative and say, um, can it be excellent if it is not inclusive? So, but at many places, I think you arrive now to, we are excellent and, or we are excellent and, but uh, uh, in inclusive. And then what Dedre said is probably right. You know, we have, diverse approaches to, or dive, you can define excellence in different areas. And I think that has been demonstrated here quite nicely in the afternoon. You got a full board of different contexts where excellence come in from uh, institutional inclusion to research, mobility, and, and, and. Um, and I think this is probably how we have to explore this now. Uh, I mean, where does an institution be ex want to be excellent? Where do colleagues at a department want to be excellent? And uh, how do they do this? So I think I take it till here. In the next round, maybe we can go a step further. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Pete. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Ulrich, and, and thank you, uh, ACA colleagues, for organizing and, and inviting me. I, I represent the European Association for International Education, but I also represent my, my University of Antwerp, uh, which is a partner in one of the European University Alliances, the UFA Young Universities uh, for the Future of Europe, which is also partly uh, my inspiration here when thinking about this concept. Um, and I think I, I, I agree very much with uh, what the two previous speakers said. Uh, traditionally, in a narrative about excellence and inclusiveness, we see this or we, we read between the lines, okay, we, we normally we aim for excellence, but now we will do a little bit less for the sake of inclusiveness. And that's absolutely uh, the wrong way to see it. I think we really need, uh, I heard the term paradigm shift, or changing the narrative and that I agree that excellence without inclusiveness and not only in the not in the sense of keep doing what we're doing but include more people that's not what it should be I think we should think about what we are doing and uh, and that has to lead to more uh, impact in terms of societal uh, benefits uh, and inclusiveness not only in the in, in in the sense of including more target groups but also including uh, in the core of what we are doing, more diverse uh, points of view, more attention to different contexts, more attention to diversity uh, of all kinds. And if, if the excellence we are aiming for does not incorporate that diversity, both in the inputs and in the outcomes that we are looking for, then it's just not excellent in this day and age. That's what I think. Uh, Thank you, Pete. Now we've all redefined excellence. Uh, and if I may ask a follow-up question to you, Michael, who you are representing an association of universities. Uh, I started my career at an association of universities. And if I look at universities, at least in my own country, which happens to be your own as well, um, is it actually true uh, that uh, university administrators, university heads, uh, institutional strategists uh, are 
looking at what makes them more inclusive rather than in what makes them stand out uh, in comparison with others? Uh, would we imagine university heads to wait with the same ex anxiety for the record in first generation students, for example, as they are uh, when the new Shanghai ranking is about to be published or the uh, uh, results of the excellence strategy in Germany. So how do you observe your, your institutions that are cooperating in the EUA, but that are also competing with each other? Um, is, is it really true that it all converges? I think you said it yourself, you know, when you said Shanghai ranking. So if somebody talks about excellence without further specification, it means research excellence. And then it's not about any kind of research, which as such can be excellent, but it's uh, research that is noted in uh, um, high ranking publications, uh, uh, funding schemes and an end. And, and um, so I think you're absolutely right, but I can see also that this is becoming a bit more complicated also for the uh, university leaders talk. I mean, you cannot just get away by just talking about this and we can see how this um, very uniform and uh, very one-channeled research excellent, how this is becoming a bit more fragmented and this has to do with several things. I think on the other one hand side, um, there's growing emphasis on teaching. We also have to perform in teaching. We, EUA published uh, last year, um, the Universities Without Walls, which also emphasizes the um, um, the th so-called third mission services to society. But I think the important point is also, it's not just about bringing up the other missions and asking for parity of esteem. You see the problems within the research itself, you know. How do you want to do open science if you just follow um, the narrow uh, um, research metrics? So what we can see, I think, at the moment that we see, I mean, the, diff, the, the missions of the university are redefined or are in the process of redefinition. And that has also implications of how you, for example, define and assess academic careers. And I think that's the crucial point at the moment where I completely agree. Um, you still have to um, somehow, you, you, you cannot just move to the other side uh, overnight, you know, you still have the uh, community in the institution which looks on the research matrix and on the rankings and and and. Um, but it's, it's, um, there are different approaches there and these have to be, if not aligned, uh, they have to be fed um, simultaneously at the same time. So thank you. So, so there is still room for improvement. Uh, may I switch uh, to, to a somewhat different uh, question, uh, Deirdre? Um, uh, the global outreach uh, in a European, in and of <laughs> uh, European higher education. Uh, and um, you reminded us, as many uh, speakers did, uh, that most of the world is not the West, uh, but is the South. Uh, and uh, do not always share the values uh, we define as universal. Uh, uh, and uh, if I, you were talking about Africa, and that's your, your special field, I just looked at the Academic Freedom Index world map, uh, where uh, Africa does not really look very green. <laughs> that is countries with much academic freedom. Uh, on the other hand, uh, of course, we need to reach out perhaps even more uh, uh, to uh, countries and education systems uh, that are different and whose rulers wish it to be different uh, from ours. So how do we reconcile that uh, with first the emphasis that we put on academic freedom and freedom of speech in, in general uh, and uh, the priority as defined by your colleague earlier this afternoon uh, for countries that share our research agenda and academic value. So how to strike a balance between the necessity of an actual global outreach uh, with looking for allies, if I may put it more, bl pr I more bluntly probably than it deserves. Yeah. I, I think the purpose of the uh, cooperation will be different. Um, 
there'll be the academic cooperation where you're working with uh, with people or uh, an institution which has shared values, the same values as as yourself, and in other cases you will be deciding when engaging uh, with your partner in a, a problemat <laughs> problematic country, so to say, no, but if you're engaging there, it's because your university has an interest to contribute to the wider societal challenge and can go, the, the, the better good is beyond then, you know, your, the effect of the system is less, uh, you don't have to work with the system in the same way. So you shouldn't stop collaborating with an institution because you don't agree with the system in the country necessarily because you're contributing to uh, safe water, you're contributing to food, you're contributing, you know, in that, in that sense. I think that's the approach. Thank you. Uh, Pete, you are uh, yourself an international education professional and you are vice president of, of an organization of uh, international education professionals. And uh, for many years, uh, international education professional meant primarily um, mobility. Uh, and then we see that access to mobility uh, is unequal. Uh, in some societies more, in others less, but it's definitely unequal. Uh, so is the way out uh, to concentrate on other forms of internationalization or what continues to be the place of physical mobility, including of those who did not have the chance to be sent to secondary school, school students to an American high school by their parents? Um, well, uh, I also heard with interest what the, your colleague from uh, DAD was, was saying in the previous session. I thought uh, she made some, some excellent points on, on, on this question. Uh, she did do one thing that rubs me the wrong way, uh, which is to use the term virtual mobility, which I'm a little bit allergic to, and I find it a very useless term. Uh, I could talk for half an hour why that is but uh, I don't think we have we have don't. time for that <laughs> but if anyone feels the urge to talk about virtual mobility sometime in the future call me and I will try to bring you to uh, another thought we we'll uh, have no, a reception right after this <laughs> yeah. no the, the reason is I think it does a real disservice to both physical mobility and to other types of internationalization to mix this up in something called virtual mobility which has no useful meaning um, but uh, I think the answer to your question is is that yes we, again on this point I feel this is a time when we have to change the narrative fundamentally and get away from putting mobility in the center of everything in my mind what really matters when we want to reach excellence in terms of internationalization of, of education of curricula uh, what matters in the end is the competences we bring to the students and to all students uh, in, in my mind that should be the goal and it should not be about physical mobility or not primarily, but it should be about bringing, and in my mind, the essential skill to bring into the curriculum is collaboration. Uh, an inclusive collaboration in the sense of collaborating with people who are different than yourself, with people who are in different contexts, but also people from different disciplines, interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, and that's the complex skill that will be the real competitive advantage of the future. As one of the previous speakers said, knowledge is everywhere. Someone who's a little bit uh, handy can find the necessary information at any given time but it's that skill the attitude also of being able to connect with others and to build a trustful trust is a very important term because it's the fuel really of progress if you can have build a trustful partnership trustful collaboration that will be the basis for real progress uh, because it will uh, it will build uh, literally a basis for taking on new challenges in the future. Uh, so that's that's the real skill we should be aiming for, uh, and that's something you learn by doing during your studies. And that can be done both online and face to face by going physically to another country and collaborating face to face. But that's a secondary consideration. What's the best tool to use? The primary uh, objective should, should be to bring this collaboration in diverse settings into the curriculum for all students and then you have you don't have the effect that uh, I sorry forgot the, the name of your colleague from the other day but what she said is let's not have um, 
okay, the, the, the first choice, mobility for the group that can do it and wants to do it, and then have a, a, a second choice, virtual mobility for the ones who, who can't, and, and organize it separately. No, we should go for 100% of students in the core of the curriculum should be collaborating with peers in other countries in some way. Uh, and, and that's the, in my mind, that should be the, 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 uh, the point. Uh, because the real challenge is not inclusivity of those who want to do it but have obstacles. The real challenge in inclusivity, in my mind, is th that big group who's not even interested in international exposure, who doesn't see any need for it or any use for it. That's the group that really where we should try to make progress. That's for sure. And it's not only about money, uh, even as a representative of funding agencies, one, one needs to say that it's, 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 it's also a matter of thinking, of ideas, of encouragement, of, uh, of peers uh, uh, sharing their experience. We are reaching the end, uh, so I, my last question to each of you is, is there any individual idea or project or program that was mentioned today that you that you find particularly encouraging or interesting, or hate it particularly. So just the, 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 one, the one concrete thing uh, that you uh, liked or intensely disliked. Would you start, Michael? I think I'm overwhelmed now. There was so much this afternoon, so I can't really pick out one particular program. Uh, maybe I can share one, one thing around 2008, I remember and you may recall that as well, that there was a discussion on whether actually this capacity building with third world countries would come to an end because we were under the growing pressure to excel in research and uh, were increasingly in assessed on research outcomes and an end. And here we are today, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it has come to the center actually and we do not call it any longer capacity building. Yeah? So I think that's, that would be my, my point here. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting how we shifted the perspective. And I think we have to think more about what we are, want our institutions actually to, to be and how we want them to perform and how we want to assess them. And this will get us away from the rankings. The rankings might change in the end. So. Thank you. Did you? Yeah, in relation to rankings, just I don't know if you saw, I'm not an expert, but there were the rankings based on the SDGs that were published last week. And again, you know, the, uh, that opens another <laughs> conversation, but uh, interesting. And their African university scored uh, quite high. I hope they don't chase after that as the only purpose in life. But um, um, I think today what was interesting, I heard a few people um, mention, you know, that the programs sometimes are not flexible enough because the funding or rules are coming from different purposes. So, you know, the Ministry of Development or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or sort of, you know, uh, the choices, the priorities, the regions with wh whom to work. Hopefully, I would think, perhaps naively, that um, if we're having a Team Europe approach and if we're sort of going to our global partners as, as a whole, um, there, there should be more correspondence now in the future between the offer um, scholarship programs, capacity building and, you know, what's going to be possible for you as agencies. Um, looking at the presentation in the previous session from the NUFIC, when you saw the areas, the th thematic disciplines they're focusing on, these are exactly the ones that are there for the global gateway. So it makes me wonder, well, you know, what's wrong then? You know, are there some tweaks that need to be done? Can we focus, can, that, can you take up that conversation with your ministries and see, you know, how you can reflect this then in, in the, your operations? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the the element that I found most um, revealing or interesting for me was actually in the in the last uh, session the the point that came up about synergy between different funders and different uh, programs and the attention that's given to you know finding the the best way to combine them. I think that's still something that's. Uh, uh, a real point of attention for the future because we still have capacity building projects uh, even in Erasmus uh, Plus and, and my experience is also that the the real added value comes usually outside the core of the, the technical thing you're trying to do. It's usually 
a broader uh, coming together of people and, and finding new opportunities. So that goes in the same direction of finding an ecosystem where we can um, find ways to, to, to progress together. Uh, thank you, Peter. I think this is one of the wonderful things in uh, international education, uh, the unexpected, uh, the unexpected uh, mechanisms, the unexpected results, the unexpected experiences uh, that then make it so much more interesting uh, than just working with your neighbor uh, uh, all year long. I will not try to make a summary of the summaries, uh, uh, just one uh, element I think it's important that we saw in this concluding discussion uh, that, um, that this is not a zero-sum game, uh, that excellence does not need to be det detrimental to inclusiveness and vice versa. Uh, and I think the most prominent examples are to tap uh, on the enormous uh, intellectual resources for both teaching and research and study uh, of women uh, as students in the as students and scholars in the global south, uh, so that uh, it's not that we are giving anything away, but that we are, uh, for the benefit of all of us, uh, we are helping to produce uh, and disseminate knowledge. And and I think that's why it is so important uh, that the global outlook uh, has a place, perhaps in the European strategy document, but much more importantly in the. European strategy for higher education as it's actually implemented, supported, encouraged uh, and done by individual institutions. And, and we hope to have contributed with this uh, event to this uh, sort of reflection and policy development. Uh, and let me conclude by a few words of thanks to my fellow panelists in this concluding panel. To all the speakers and uh, everybody who attended and to the few people who even intervened <laughs> uh, from the audience. Uh, so thank you for be having been with us uh, for that long uh, this afternoon. And thanks, of course, to the fellow uh, organizers of this uh, event uh, uh, with Aka. Somebody wants to talk. Yeah, so go ahead. Before I thank, uh, give any further thanks. Thank you very we'll much for uh, <laughs> having a word. And actually, I'm Svetlana Shitikova, National Erasmus Plus Office Coordinator from Ukraine. And uh, since today there were a lot of time Ukraine mentioned, and I really would like to reflect a little bit, if I may, to contribute a little bit to the takeaways uh, for today's conference. And I really appreciate the opportunity to participate. And also to say to all of you that we uh, value a lot of your care, support, help and solidarity with Ukraine. And also for all the flexibility which is done and all the uh, support, specific supports and special measures provided for Ukraine. Uh, I'm also uh, the part of the network of the Erasmus uh, Plus offices and uh, we would like to also draw your attention that uh, please do not forget uh, to include us also in the communication for the program uh, and close cooperation for the promotion. And uh, you might know, and today we would confirm that there is a tendering now for the information contact points as well within the whole globe of Erasmus uh, countries, where there would be also the points to promote the program. This is coming back to the previous uh, session, which was there. But uh, for, for some takes away about this uh, flexibility and by the way in Jordan also there is an excellent uh, Erasmus Plus office for Matthias to, to contact for the further promotion. Uh, then uh, for the flexibility and special measures what we see on sport again in Ukraine that um, uh, there is not that much also awareness among the uh, European universities about how to apply this uh, flexibility. There are a lot of like uh, uh, contradictions or understanding of the information in a different way. And also there is no such document available openly. This is also the request to European Commission somehow to publish it because even in Ukraine when we communicate about this flexibility, uh, the international relations offices ask us to 
provides uh, some kind of document about these details, uh, explanation of uh, how it works, that this is the uh, actually the directive of European Commission, but not the interpretation or translation of, of Erasmus Office, of uh, some information they got from the national agency, because we are in the network and cooperating a lot, and we really want to, to make difference and to uh, apply all the flexibility and measures which are open for Ukraine uh, correctly, but not losing our students, because some students actually uh, didn't uh, contact the uh, higher education institutions, uh, even though they are continuing to be the students and benefited from this mobility, uh, like uh, an additional support, which is cr critically appreciated by, by everybody, just saving the lives and keeping on uh, the, the study for Ukraine, not like study out Ukraine, out of Ukraine, but uh, to get the best and innovative knowledge and then come back to, uh, to, to give further like uh, uh, rebirth of the country, would say. Then uh, also the uh, about the uh, these details on this flexibility, uh, we had uh, uh, also the communication, a lot of uh, negotiation with the rectors of the universities because they again consider it as a brain drain. So even uh, like understanding that Erasmus uh, short, I mean, exchanges program is, is not about this. They are now currently very much afraid of it. So again, uh, even students apply to us and saying, uh, Svetlana, will you tell us if we would like to stay after exchange program at the Houston University, should we pay back the uh, um, scholarship, the grant we got? And if yes, then is it possible to do it in parts? So then they, they even thinking, you know, to, to, to get back this grant for, for continuing study in the European Union. But again, there should be our communication and maybe some mechanisms within the cooperation between the universities uh, at the level of the institutional agreement, or maybe the level of the program saying that's okay, this is the exchange program. And in any case, you should receive the Ukrainian diploma and uh, just having your experience recognized and uh, with all the uh, flexibility applied, sometimes it is lost, actually. I mean, uh, this inter-institutional agreement, uh, which in fact, I would like to assure you that within 24 uh, oblasts of Ukraine, a uh, majority of universities are still operational. They are either displaced or working uh, or implementing distance learning or blended learning in 12 uh, oblasts of Ukraine. It is unbelievable, of course, because there is a war and there is no safe place in Ukraine. And uh, if you consider that uh, we have uh, 2,000 missiles actually targeted Ukraine, all over Ukraine so far, and also we have a lot of destroyed and uh, premises, but infrastructure, but but every day I update the presentation with the lives of people. So this is like, uh, uh, with no future, with no life anymore. And that's, uh, that's something which we also should bear in mind. And uh, also they're uh, talking about the um, uh, inclusion of students and staff. Uh, I would like to uh, request your communication to the universities that our students, once they arrive, of course they need psychological help as well as stuff, but they also need to be heard, heard of the experience, experience in war if they can't share it, because it's also like surviving it every time you share it is difficult. But also about the culture, about the actually the experience living before war and also how do they feel? Is they feel being really a European one? Or is, uh, do they feel exactly, uh, or do they understand uh, and share the uh, value, European values, but, not, uh, is, uh, but, but it is not the, just a simple list for them? And I'm sure that you would hear back that this is really not the list. And uh, our students now and professors uh, are defending these uh, European values and the whole world actually in the front line. And everybody has the, its front line in Ukraine. This is not only military one, but also humanitarian, where uh, the contribution of people-to-people -people contacts and uh, uh, youth, uh, uh, European voluntary, oh, sorry, uh, solidarity corps, and also um, credit mobility and other, other, other like Tempus Erasmus Mundus, Jean Monnet and other actions are now having the specific impact and evidence that uh, there was the first helping hand from all the partners to Ukrainian ones uh, provided by this, uh, this, this, this large network which was already created there. And uh, just, uh, I, I, I'm finishing, I know that the, 
the, uh, the networking is quite important in this thing. Uh, then um, also within this uh, mobility uh, scheme, the uh, um, cooperation now is uh, uh, very much needed in terms of the practical skills for our students because the theory they can learn in parallel within the university uh, studying online, but the practical skills, uh, access to the laboratories and also to the open resources, maybe to some simulators, which is extremely, should be, should be in focus also on this mobility. Maybe you'd also orient your universities towards this kind of cooperation and like open resources and uh, uh, access to the professional networks because you have a lot of uh, innovative experience to be shared and uh, to integrate maybe the researchers, the staff, the academic staff and the students into these networks where usually you have like high uh, fees, uh, not affordable, but maybe at this point there is an opportunity to, to join this part of thing. And we are now discussing the Open University with Ukraine and also the cooperation with this uh, issue would be really very much helpful. And uh, cooperation projects at the end, uh, like uh, EU, uh, European uh, Universities Alliances and uh, Partnership for Digital Readiness. Uh, these are two initiatives where Ukrainians also could be integrated very well with this flexibility approach already provided. And then just uh, uh, coming back to the cooperation with uh, between an integration and inclusion of different countries, we should also uh, a little bit remember that we also invested a lot into uh, European Union invested a lot to, uh, to 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 Russian Federation and the high education in Russian Federation and starting in 1993 together with Ukraine, uh, we joined the program and uh, you could see the difference in terms of the. Uh, sharing the, the values and uh, also joining the Bologna process in 2005 for uh, the people, I mean the soldiers who are now like uh, doing a lot of horror things uh, in Ukraine. Um, they had been educated within this period of time already and that's uh, like also should be uh, taken care of uh, very attentively within current cooperation, seeing what is the impact, what uh, if this uh, list of, of the European values uh, just is the list for some countries or just so for some people or not. So I think that it should be also be uh, like uh, studied uh, also the, the impact of like Jean Monnet and, and other things which we are surviving now in, the, in this uh, really war like uh, um, a lot of trauma around all starting from the uh, kids, the families and everybody. And, and that's not like, uh, not the statistics, unfortunately. And we ain't in front like there. But uh, we are strong and defending and with all the support, uh, that's really makes us a lot stronger. And so we will win and we would appreciate and looking forward to welcome you all in Ukraine after victory and helping us to rebuild our country together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Svetlana, for sharing this information and, uh, and your viewpoint. Uh, and I think it's, it's true for Ukraine and it's true for other partners. Uh, first of all, we need to listen what our partners want and need, uh, rather than tell them what they should need. Uh, so I was about to thank everybody who has contributed as speakers, as an audience, as speakers from the audience uh, to this event. I was about to thank our partner organizations, uh, the Norwegian Directorate for Higher Education and Skills, uh, the Czech Cello, so the Czech representation uh, here in Brussels, the DAAD and VLUR. Uh, the Flemish organization for having co-organized uh, this event. Let me thank uh, the Secretariat staff who has prepared it and organized it. And I know what, what that entails, so it was a lot of work. Thank you so much for conceptualizing and actually organizing it. And finally, thanks to the technical team that has made this hybrid event possible uh, once more. So we've, we've done our work for today and I invite all of you for a cocktail reception outside right after this. Thank you so much. Let it go.